Perfect. I think I'm unmuted now. Great. So my name is Ashley Ahrens. I'm the Client Services Director here at the Rocky Mountain Victim Law Center. Um, to give you a little insight into who I am and why I'm doing this presentation, so I've been at RMBLC for about two and a half years. Before that, I worked in um, working with youth who are experiencing homelessness, and before that, I was in grad school. Um, I have my Master's of Social Work and my Master's of Social Policy. I received those from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so like I said, my role here as the Client Services Director is primarily doing direct service work as well as working with service providers, both community and systems-based law enforcement, district attorney's offices, and doing trainings like these. Um, so Kelly, I'll turn it over to you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Kelly Dixon, and I am an attorney. Um, I have been practicing law and working in the violence against women field for about 14 years now. Um, I was a prosecutor for a little over seven and a half of those years, both in the 18th Judicial District in the Arapahoe and Douglas offices, as well as for the Attorney General's office in American Samoa. After that, I joined RMBLC back in 2012, and I was there for about two years before I relocated to Maryland and have sort of come back recently um, over the last several months and have been helping out as well. Um, so I have a lot of experience both as a former prosecutor, as a victim's rights attorney, and will be providing some of the legal um, background and, and um, perspective on some of the issues that we're going to be talking about. So Ashley, can you go ahead and start us off? Perfect. Um, so first and foremost, thanks to CICASA for allowing us to do this presentation today. We're really excited to bring this information to the community in a format that's hopefully accessible for the folks who aren't here in the Denver metro area where our office resides. Um, and of course, thanks to the participants for coming and joining us. We really want this to be as interactive and engaging of a webinar as possible. So if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box, like Agata mentioned, and then um, we'll answer them as soon as we can and certainly circle back to common themes or issues that we see sort of coming up over and over again if there are questions that crop up. Um, so moving right along. So just to tell you a little bit about RMBLC, so our mission here um, is to transform the criminal justice system to consistently value and respect victims, victims and vigorously safeguard victims' rights. So there are two programs in RMBLC. The first is the VRA program, which is where I work. Um, we provide direct legal representation in criminal cases. We provide consultation for victims and service providers, prosecutors, advocates, um, regarding cases that either that person is experiencing themselves or if you're a service provider, a case that may have come up in your course of work. We provide tons of information and referrals um, because we are an office that works on such a specific area of law. Um, we can't help on civil cases. Traditionally, we can't help on those cases. So a lot of times we'll take the information that someone is willing to provide to us and get them connected to services in the community where we know that they can get the help that they need. Um, as well as we have a program in our office now called the Legal Information Network of Colorado. Many of you might know that as the Federal Wraparound Grant. Um, and right now that's specifically located in serving folks here in Denver, but we are working to get those individuals connected to civil legal services. So traditionally the VRA side of things doesn't and cannot provide that service, but that's where LINK steps in. So our office is working to, as I mentioned, get folks connected to civil legal services. And then on top of all of that, all of our different programs at RMVLC, we also provide trainings like these, getting folks in the community acquainted with what it means to legally advocate, um, what our services might look like, et cetera. So to go a little bit over the agenda and kind of what you can expect to learn today or experience today, so we're trying to have a main focus on really identifying and understanding the various rights that a victim has related to privacy and safety as someone navigates through the criminal justice system. Um, additionally, wanting to examine the different issues and key concepts related to privacy, safety concerns, um, some of the main ones that we'll touch on would be confidentiality and its difference between that and privilege, um, releases of information, and then who has the right to waive that privilege and or confidentiality? And what might that look like um, in terms of everyday practice for many of the folks listening in? Um, additionally, we are going to go throughout, you'll see these great little text boxes um, at the bottom of slides talking about practical tips, how advocates can offer support, um, 
shift their way of thinking around services to better protect um, the privacy of their clients, but then also to allow them to better inform the people that they're working with about their private information, who might disclose it, and, and what's happening when it touches all these different folks. And, and just to really emphasize, um, you know, our overall goal today is really to ensure that we as service providers can help victims understand what their rights are, to be fully informed before they make a decision that could impact their privacy um, and or safety, and then how that can be used, especially um, in a negative way, but also positively in their case at large. So we want to just make sure that folks understand that, you know, knowledge is going to be power, so that's what we're hoping to provide to you today. So our first big test as presenters today is with this poll. Um, we're going to try and see if we can get the poll up and running. And what we're asking is, you know, who's here in the room? All right, I press the button. I think here we go. So I'm looking forward to hearing who might be in the room. Obviously, I know we have some community-based advocates. I'm seeing some answers finally come in. Um, some system-based folks, law enforcement, um, prosecutors, other attorneys, or mental health professionals. So those are the options. Um, I'm seeing about 70% of folks have voted, so I'll give it just a couple more seconds to see if there's any stragglers um, who might want to share a little bit about who they are and um, you know, what category, they, category of service provider they might fall into. All right, last five seconds or so, and then I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Great. So... It looks like the majority of folks here today, about 60%, are community-based advocates. And I'm going to share this, so hopefully it'll pop up on your screen too. <laughs> um, so we have about 60% community-based advocates, 20% system-based folks, law enforcement at 13%, and then 7% for both prosecutors or other attorneys and mental health professionals. Um, if you had other, if, if you do not fall into any of these categories, please um, let me know and we can just take a look at that in either the, in the chat section. Great. Well, a follow-up um, question, excuse me, which I will have you put into the chat section if you don't mind, is where are people calling from? You know, we as an organization are statewide, and um, when I was explaining sort of what we do before, that would have probably been helpful to know. Um, so we often work with folks all over the, all over the state. So where are you as service providers, as attorneys, prosecutors, systems-based folks, mental health professionals, where are you within the state? Um, or are you from out of state? Just to give me a sense of who's here and where people are coming from. So if you wouldn't mind just throwing that into the chat box. Let's see. Not seeing any answers yet. I'm not sure. Oh, I think maybe perhaps, here we go. All right, well, I'm, I'm not seeing any answers, so I'm not sure. Perhaps I'm looking in the wrong place, um, but we can come back to that. That's not a problem. Um, if that is imperative or interested for folks, or looks like maybe they're popping into the questions box. Here we go. So it looks like we have some people from out of state. Um, Gunnison, awesome. Boulder, Portland, but a service provider, their client is here in Colorado. Great, thank you for joining us. Um, Mexico, and yes, we are asking what state are folks calling in from, and if you're here in Colorado, just a little bit more locally, what county you might be in, that's helpful for us to know what jurisdiction your questions might be relating to. Um, California, Salida, Frisco, KP County, Summit County, great. Thanks so much for sharing all that. Again, it just helps us have an understanding of where folks are coming from um, and sort of the context in which you're asking the questions. So moving right along, I'm going to pass this over to Kelly to talk to us a little bit about Victims Rights 101. Okay, so I just want to give a very, very quick overview of victims' rights because um, a, a lot of the times when privacy or safety issues come up, one of the first places you want to kind of start to look for possible avenues of redress is in your your um, victims' rights legislation and, and laws, because oftentimes they do provide some sort of avenue for help or, or redress. So in Colorado, and this is going to be very, very quick, um, in, in Colorado we are lucky enough that our victims' rights are grounded in a constitutional amendment. 
Um, so the constitutional amendment, along with the enabling legislation that lists out what all the rights are, how those rights can be accessed, um, is what forms our overall body of law. In Colorado, um, it's important whenever you're looking to see if you can access those rights under the VRA, um, you need to find out who's covered. And in Colorado, um, we are defined as a person. So it's uh, not corporations. It only pertains to crimes that deal with real people. It's typically the victim themselves or um, their, uh, it could be a parent, a spouse, a child, a grandparent, um, another uh, legally designated representative. Um, the statute itself spells out all of the specific relationships that could be that person that qualifies that person as a victim under the Victims' Rights Act that gives them the right to access these various rights. Um, and every state is different. Since I know there's a bunch of folks from out of state, you'll also want to make sure that you are familiar with your own state's um, source of victims' rights laws and, and who qualifies. Um, who qualifies also depends on what specific crime it has been uh, committed. So there are typically it's crimes against people that qualify as victims for purposes of the, the victims' rights legislation as opposed to crimes against people. So, you know, you're typically going to see it in any of your assaults, um, sex crimes, batteries, those sort of things. Um, you're not typically going to see it in a property damage type of situation unless there's a specific relationship like a domestic violence relationship that is involved with that property damage and that would then bring the person back in. So it's really important to start by seeing what your legislature, what your legislation defines as a victim and what crimes it covers. Um, it, the victim's rights legislation will then go through and spell out, okay, who has to do what? Um, and in Colorado, the folks that have the obligations under here are your law enforcement, district attorneys, the courts, um, and all of the post-conviction organizations, so probation, DOC, DYC, community corrections, your state um, mental health hospital. Um, what's important to note, I think, is that there is one entity that is clearly not covered here that does not have obligations, and that is the defense. They don't owe any duties under the victims' rights legislation to victims to ensure that their rights are, are being honored. Um, and it's also the, the other important thing that I think is, is important to remember whenever you're looking at, at um, how these rights are applied or enforced is that in Colorado we have some great language and the legislature made it clear that all of the rights that are listed out through the um, statute are to be honored and protected in a manner no less vigorous than the protections afforded to criminal defendants. So it's that is some great language that when we you get to the point where you're asking the court to do something, or you're asking the DAs or law enforcement or somebody in the system who has obligations under the VRA to do something, this isn't a secondary right to to defendants. So that's really important and and is a great um, sort of background to bring to any request that you make. Um, Ashley, if you want to go to the next slide. So some of the main basic rights that victims have who qualify under the VRA are the right to be notified, and that can be notified of various hearings, notified of the status of the investigation, notified of a number of things um, and what's happening and what's going on. They have the right to be present at all critical stages um, and, and at a number of other um, steps along the process. They have the right to be heard at all critical stages. Um, and there are specific hearings that your particular victims' rights legislation will spell out um, where victims actually have a right to be heard and to speak. Um, and have a voice in the system, and so that varies from state to state. Um, and frankly, it, it often you know varies from courtroom to courtroom as far as actual practice goes, because it, a lot of the times folks just aren't necessarily as um, up to speed on all of the rights. And so this is one of the things that we do at RMBLC is we're able to help point out 
what is actually required under the law, what um, victims are allowed to to be heard at, what, what types of hearings, um, what types of issues they are allowed to actually have a voice in, um, and point that out for folks who may not be um, up to speed on all of that. Uh, it's also really important to know that the first and paramount right under the VRA is um, the right to be treated with fairness, respect, and dignity. And I think that that's where a lot of the sort of privacy issues um, can come loop back around to. Um, because when we're talking about privacy and victims and survivors as they proceed throughout the criminal justice process, it, making sure that they are treated with fairness, respect, and dignity um, is really important. And, and I think those things go hand in hand. So we'll talk about that a little later, too. Um, victims also have the right to be free from intimidation, harassment, or abuse. Again, this is where some of the safety issues get grounded in the victims' rights legislation, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of this later. Um, along those lines, there's also a right to participate in court proceedings via alternative means. So if you are having a safety issue, if you, um, you know, don't feel comfortable coming to court, you have a right as a victim to participate in the process without actually being in the courtroom. Typically, that looks like a phone phone call, phoning into various hearings, um, and it there can be other alternate means as well, but um, there are other things that, that can be done from an advocacy standpoint that, get, that are supported by the victim's rights legislation that can help protect a victim's privacy. Um, and again, there are various privacy protections throughout the VRA. Um, it's important to note that all of these rights kind of differ as far as um, how they kick in depending on if you're pre-conviction or post-conviction. Pre-conviction, all of these things are automatic. Um, victims are automatically entitled to these rights if they are a victim for, you know, as defined for um, the type of person in the um, crime under the VRA. Post-conviction, it's an opt-in situation. So you typically have to request that you want to assert your rights under the VRA. That request, that opt-in is almost always in writing. Um, and then from there, once you have opted in, then all of the rights continue to make sure that you're getting notified of any parole hearings or things of that sort. Um, it's also important to note that there are various points along the process where some of these um, rights are intertwined. For example, we're going to talk a little later about motions to quash subpoenas um, for documents as well as potentially for a victim's presence. Um, there's, there's absolutely things in the VRA that can help you fight some of those things, especially when they're being done to harass someone um, unnecessarily. Um, and there's all kinds of crazy things that we see at RMVLC uh, where victims' privacy has been put at issue. We've seen requests by the defense to gain access to the victim's home because the defense has said that, oh, well, we need access to the crime scene. Um, okay, those sort of things can, can be an incredible invasion. Not only has somebody been victimized, and victimized in their own home, but now the defense is asking the court for access to come in and and view the scene and do their own investigation in your own personal private space. So those are some of the types of things um, where you know RMBLC for certain, as well as you know prosecutors can help fight some of those things. Um, again, other requests that we've seen are things asking for testing of the victim, psychological testing, mental health testing, drug testing. Um, again, just a tremendous invasion of privacy, especially for somebody who has already been victimized. Um, so these are just some of the kind of crazy requests that we see come through, um, and there are things that, that can be done, um, and uh, as well as helping folks in some of those high-profile um, media cases help protect their anonymity. So um, there's a lot of little bits that we can pull from the VRA as well as good advocacy that we're going to talk about throughout that can help victims um, retain that privacy and that safety as much as possible throughout the process. So, Ashley? Yeah. 
Okay, so it's it's really important um, to kind of wrap your head around how important privacy is to a victim or survivor um, as they enter the criminal justice system. Oftentimes, both the investigation and the prosecution of crimes, especially when you're dealing with crimes like domestic violence or sexual assault, these types of, of crimes themselves, as well as everything that it takes to build a case, can involve extremely personal information. And crime victims are often extremely reluctant to share that personal information. They've already been violated, um, and they want to hold on to whatever sort of privacy it, it, that they have. Um, they often feel embarrassed and ashamed about what happened. Uh, they have concerns about sharing and safeguarding their own personal information, and, and a lot of that is because there is a very real and overwhelming fear for their safety. Um, and you take all of that and add it to the fact that following an assault, victims are often repeatedly asked to tell multiple people throughout the criminal justice process, through the investigation phase, through the prosecution phase, through any medical um, emergency outreach that is necessary. They're repeatedly asked to disclose private information, to repeat their histories, um, and it's, it can be a very traumatic experience. And so it's really important to keep that in the back of your mind as you assist victims through the criminal justice process. Hmm. Do you want to talk about the practical yeah. tip? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so yeah, our first practical tip is really around that idea of, you know, victims talk to so many different individuals in the course of even just the beginning, um, but certainly throughout the tendency of their case. And usually what we see from folks who are working to help victims be able to keep track of things, because we know that trauma affects the ways in which someone can recall who they've spoken to, um, recall the organizations they've talked to. We get many calls here where people um, have already called us and completed an intake and don't recall that they've talked with us. So a lot of times I see a lot of, in particular, system-based folks or folks who work in community um, organizations that are specific, in particular, to DV and sex assault provide sheets for um, victims to help track sort of who have you talked to, what's their phone number, where are they from. And one thing that I suggest um, as an advocate is that on those sheets we also give victims an opportunity to say what level of confidentiality or privilege does this person have related to the conversation that I've either had with them or I'm about to have with them. Um, that way when we get to the talk which is coming up in just a few sheets few slides about confidentiality or privilege, a victim has an opportunity to say, what have I told someone who has no confidentiality or privilege, like law enforcement or a systems-based advocate, um, versus what have I told a community-based advocate who in Colorado may have privilege um, if they're working with the DV or sex assault victims and they're identified as that type of an advocate, or someone who's an attorney, or someone who maybe I'm working with on a different issue that's sort of related to my crime and I may have disclosed them. Housing is always a good example. You know, oh, I, I'm, I'm looking for housing because I was in a DV incident or I had an, a DV incident with my current partner and I'm, I'm looking to leave. Um, you know, who has privilege, who has confidentiality, and who has neither, and an opportunity to include that on a sheet where you're already tracking who you're talking to. So um, the other piece I just wanted to bring up is that we have a couple questions and I think I can answer them somewhat quickly here before we jump into the next slide. Um, so First one is, are the victim's rights being talked about applying only to Colorado law? Yes, um, they only apply to Colorado law. As Kelly mentioned, we do have a constitutional amendment here in Colorado as well as some um, statutes that apply to how that is enforced in, 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 um, in Colorado. So you would have to look into your own state's laws, into their constitution to see sort of where your victim's rights lie, how they're enforced, and what they might look like in your state. Um, and then yes, we will, the second question is about whether we're providing the PowerPoint to attendees after the webinar is over. Yes, we will absolutely send that out. Um, probably not ourselves, we'll send that to CASA and they will send it to you. So those are our two questions, so moving right along. And again, if you have more questions, please feel free to, to include those and we look forward to answering them. And I'll just say real quickly um, that as far as the victims' rights uh, laws that we'll talk about, there are some specific laws we'll talk about later on that we go through. 
um, and some specific protections that Colorado's VRA affords. But many of the things that I went over at the beginning, the right to be notified, present, and heard at, at critical stages, the right to be treated with fairness, respect, and dignity, to have your privacy um, respected, those are all general ideas and things that are found in almost every single jurisdiction. In, in the country. So um, it may be worded just slightly different. There may be specific things that apply for your state um, that differ from Colorado, but there are generally um, general same ideas throughout the country. Um, so, okay, turning back to dealing with uh, protecting a victim's privacy, the, I think the big key point to take uh, away is that knowledge is what is is key here um, in helping victims navigate the criminal justice system. Um, it's important for service providers to first and, foremost under, first and foremost understand what victims consider to be private um, and then also be able to explain what information is considered private under the law. Those two things can be very different um, and in a victim's mind, sometimes they are exactly the same. So there may be things that, that victims consider to be private that just have no protections at all. Um, and so it's really important to have those sort of conversations um, and discuss these things with victims up front. Um, it's really important because victims, they don't have control over most things in the criminal justice system. But having, giving them knowledge and setting up realistic expectations for what's to come is what will lead to a successful experience, no matter what the ultimate outcome is. We can never promise somebody a conviction at the end of the day. We can never promise somebody a specific outcome. But what we can do is we can help manage expectations, give them the knowledge to be able to prepare themselves for what is coming. Um, and doing that really helps, like I said, prepare them for what to expect. It will help encourage their cooperation throughout the process. If they know what's going to happen, they're more likely to engage. A, a more engaged victim helps make a better prosecution and a better, you know, stronger case. So. It helps everyone. Keeping victims and survivors in the dark never is a good thing, and it doesn't help anyone. Um, it, the more knowledge that they have, it helps them pro, helps prevent them from feeling like the system misled them or betrayed them. Um, and giving no, this sort of knowledge also helps empower victims to really take control of their circumstances and make informed decisions make voluntary assertions or waivers where it's appropriate and where they choose to do that. Um, it will also assist professionals with whom victims come into contact protect their, to help protect victim safety um, and privacy to the best of their ability. So having these discussions out in the open, up front, laying out all the possibilities, getting clear understandings um, for or what victims expect and, and what can actually be done under the law is super important. Um, and then Ashley, I think, has some good information on the practical tip here. Yeah, so we have the practical tip that's on the screen, but before that, I actually want to build a little bit off of what Kelly's saying, because knowledge is absolutely key. And part of, I think, what we as service providers, and in particular social workers, um, hold as really valuable is this concept of informed consent. And we as service providers and people providing a lot of this information, that, especially the frontline work that we do with victims, so we have to understand what's going on in order to better support victims. The other component to that is that, as Kelly mentioned, most victims don't have control over anything. In addition, they often don't have practice on how to interact with um, individuals who may be asking them these questions. I know for a lot of folks, myself included when I started this job, it's a little intimidating to talk to attorneys if you've never had those interactions before. And um, I wasn't in a state of trauma when I first started here. Um, and so it took, still took time. So in addition to knowledge being key, practice is really, really helpful. So if we, as you see in the practical tip, get to know what our community-based um, resources, our system-based advocates, what their confidentiality levels are, we can help inform victims better, but then also give them an opportunity to practice with us how to say no, how to self-advocate. Um, I think one of the hardest things for folks is when they're caught off guard by the idea that, well, anything you tell me, I have to tell to the district attorney's office, and they have to disclose that information to the defense. Um, this is just an example. We'll talk a little bit about those disclosure 
pieces um, a little bit later in this presentation, but just as an example, that can catch folks off guard if they're not prepared for it and not knowing how to say no to that if they then don't want to disclose something or how to then ask, like, I think I need to speak to somebody who has the confidentiality before I share all this information with you. Um, so building through informed consent an opportunity for someone to work through how they might want to engage with someone who has more or less confidentiality or privilege than other people in the system. Um, again, the other piece of the practical tip is that we want to make sure that we're doing our research because we can only control ourselves, right? Um, we don't know if other organizations are regularly disclosing. If you're um, referring people out, just get a sense of, um, am I referring you to somebody who has more or less um, either confidentiality or privilege than I do? And should this, how might this affect this person's case? And why don't I let them know in advance so that they can make a more informed decision about whether they want to follow through with that referral? Um, so we did get another question, so I just will go ahead and answer that really quick. And the question is, um, how do you support Spanish-speaking families to get VRA rights um, enforced when law enforcement shares no information about the sex assault case on a child? Um, the family has reached out repeatedly, but they are Spanish-speaking and get no information. That's a great question. So oftentimes we see communities that are marginalized, particularly those with a different language, not receiving callbacks um, as quickly because of capacity issues or there aren't any Spanish-speaking um, staff people to help facilitate a conversation. So usually um, in our office, if a call like that came in, we might partner with um, either an organization that has someone who understands the legal background and is working with that person in a community-based context to jointly call. Um, and advocate for them in English to get them to call back the individuals in Spanish and find out where that breakdown in communication is occurring. A lot of times we call that technical assistance where our office will call, gather information, um, and or advocate on behalf of the victim to rebuild communication so that the case can move forward. Um, particularly on cases where the victim and the either it's law enforcement or the um, prosecution are on the same page about what they'd like to see down the road, usually that's a conviction for most families. Uh, you know, we can call and help rebuild that communication because we want to establish something that's really strong because no matter what our office does, even if we were to directly represent that family, um, that prosecutor is still the one who's going to be asking questions at trial um, and that relationship needs to be strong and solid before someone goes to trial and, and usually that's what we're trying to do is rebuild trust, rebuild communication, um, and a lot of times we as um, everyone in our office speaks English and we have a few bilingual staff, but we use our English speaking privilege to help advocate um, for families that don't have that privilege or are monolingual Spanish speaking or other languages. Great question. Okay, so navigating confidentiality. So we're going to kind of break this down in the next few slides about what exactly confidentiality is. Um, generally, it's, it's the protection of personal information. Um, it's the, the protection of somebody's privacy. There's a number of, of ways that can give rise to confidentiality. Um, there's a number of relationships that may um, be a confidential relationship for a victim or a survivor. Um, and, and, but confidentiality is really what helps victims feel empowered as they choose to t who they are going to tell what to um, as they make their way through the criminal justice system. It really is a way to build trust and rapport, and it helps support victims in feeling in control of their, their information. And it, and it is having some sort of um, mechanisms in place that a victim can access where they do have confidentiality is really the way to help victims navigate the system in a trauma-informed way. Um, I think what's most important um, to remember is who doesn't have confidentiality in the criminal justice system. Um, and who doesn't have confidentiality is prosecutors, law enforcement, system-based advocates, and it's really important to have that conversation with victims and survivors up front. Um, when I was a prosecutor, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard victims refer to me as their attorney, um, and, and that's a frequent misconception that victims and survivors think that the prosecutor is their personal attorney. The criminal justice system is not set up like that. The, the prosecutor represents the state. They have an overarching duty to seek justice, whatever that means. Um, and at times, in seeking justice, 
sometimes a, a, an avenue that they may need to go down may differ from what a victim wants to see done. So it's really important to ensure that victims understand because people also just think, oh, you're my attorney. Obviously, that's, you know, anything I tell you is attorney-client privilege, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and so blurring that line with the prosecutor can lead to some disastrous consequences. So having that conversation with victims about who does have confidentiality, who doesn't, that the prosecutor is not their attorney, they're definitely someone that they, you know, we need to, like Ashley said, have a good relationship, have good communication, be on the same team because that makes for a stronger case. Um, but it's really important to remind them that the detective that is investigating their case, the victim advocate at the DA's office, the prosecutor themselves, those folks don't have confidentiality. Um, and why that's important is because they, all of those parties, have obligations to disclose information to the defense. Um, and that's something that I think most victims, um, and frankly a lot of I think victim advocates that don't practice in areas where they're having a lot of interaction with the criminal justice system itself, um, really understand that. That everything that it comes into the possession of law enforcement is deemed in the possession of a prosecutor, whether they actually have it or not. Um, and that information is ultimately turned over to the defense through a process called discovery. And that's just the exchanging of information um, to, to the other side. Um, what's also really important is prosecutors have both a legal and an ethical obligation to disclose what you may have heard as Brady material or exculpatory material. It's basically any evidence tends to negate the um, guilt of the defendant. And the important thing there is that the person who gets to determine whether or not something is exculpatory is the defense. It's not the prosecution. So it's not something that the DA can just say, yeah, I don't think that this particular piece of information really tends to, um, you know, negate the, the guilt of the defendant, so I'm just not going to turn it over. Um, in practice, what happens is everything gets turned over um, because that ultimately is a call the defense gets to make. and. If they don't see it, they can't make that call, and it's almost always going to be an argument of, no, that actually is exculpatory, and it should have been turned over. And so not wanting to do anything that is going to ultimately damage a potential verdict down the road, what really happens in practicality is everything gets turned over. And so it's just really important to hammer home, not just once, but multiple times throughout the process, that law enforcement victim advocates from the DA's office and system-based advocates, as well as the prosecutors, do not have confidentiality. Um, I think additionally to that, an important piece to throw in there too is that the it's not a two-way street with the defense. If right. a victim chooses to talk with the defense, that information isn't then turned over to the DA's office. So there is right. the potential for that information to then stay with the defense until trial even. Um, so. I think that's another important piece of the puzzle that oftentimes advocates who don't traditionally work frequently with victims or survivors who are going through the criminal justice process, um, they may not know that. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so we've kind of used the words privilege and confidentiality, and, and there is a very clear distinction. So confidentiality is a duty, um, and it's basically the broad application of privacy laws used to create a duty to protect a victim's information and safety. Privilege, on the other hand, is an actual legal right, um, and it's a legal right that gives both the sharer and the holder of information special protection under the law to actually refuse to disclose privileged communications within the confines of certain relationships. So what that means is when you think about confidentiality, it's, it's kind of the bigger umbrella. Um, and it can be um, formed from a number of different things. So it can be a contractual duty that is formed through a service agreement, an employment agreement, a funding agreement, which is, I think, quite frequent. There's 
um, requirements. Anybody who receives VAWA funds, um, there's confidentiality uh, duties as part of receiving those monies. Um, or, or a client agreement. It could just be um, a way of doing business that an organization has decided that's how they're going to interact for their, for their business. Um, it can be an ethical duty, right? a code of ethics or a code of conduct. Um, it can be a statutory duty that's governed by some sort of professional regulation or a particular legislative scheme. Um, you know, it can be, you know, you, you are in this particular occupation and you, the codes of ethics of your occupation require duties of confidentiality. So there's a number of ways that, that somebody can have or engage in confidentiality. Um, privilege, however, is you always defined specifically by statute. I mean, it's a specific legal right. Um, so we're going to talk about that next. I'm Perfect. Go to next I'm going to answer a couple questions before we jump right into the sure. deeper understanding of privilege and confidentiality. So the first one is, how does um, the VRA and Victims Comp interact when Victims Comp requires victims to cooperate with the criminal investigation, but they want some privacy? Kelly, would you want to answer that one? Sure. So, um, I mean, victims need to, in order to cooperate, I mean, I think it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So, every, in Colorado, for instance, and this is different from state to state, but in Colorado, um, the victim's compensation is jurisdictionally, um, it's by each district. So, um, you know, there's a victim's comp board in the 18th and another in the 2nd, and so each each judicial district has their own victim's comp board. Um, cooperating doesn't mean that you have to give up your rights to privacy and confidentiality. It doesn't mean that you have to automatically sign over every right that you have. That's not at all what that means. Um, and so victims are entitled to assert their their rights under the laws of, of the state. Um, and so I think you need to look at, you know, if there's a particular situation where somebody feels like it's, um, there's a conflict, um, you know, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm not sure if the question is, is kind of asking about um, somebody who just doesn't want to participate at all or somebody who just doesn't want to turn over my mental health records. Um, you know, because I think it, it kind of depends on the specific facts of a, of a situation. Um, but generally, if they are participating and cooperating, which means they've reported to police, they're not, like, not returning phone calls, they're not stonewalling everything, um, then there's nothing that you know, that prevents them from asserting their rights under the law and still getting services from victims' compensation. Um, but if there is a specific thing that you are thinking of, you know, that's one of those technical assistance questions that maybe we can, um, you can contact our office on and we can kind of look and see if there's some specific issues that um, we might help, be able to help sort out, so. And to add to that, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, but victims' comp is confidential. So even if you're receiving mental health services but don't want to turn over your mental health records to the prosecution um, for the case, just because you're receiving mental health services that's being paid for by victims' comp does not mean suddenly those specific mental health services are free for the court to look at, free for the defense to look at. That is all considered confidential. Um, so it's not as if using we'll talk a little bit about what waivers mean, but using victim's comp isn't a waiver for those services then to be called into court. Right, exactly. And there, there's definitely, we've had cases where the defense has tried to subpoena all of victim's comp's records um, saying, oh, well, the victim waived their privilege to be able to access, um, you know, have victim's comp pay for them. And that's, that's just not the status of the law in Colorado. And so we've helped fight some of those things and we've been successful in those those fights where um, you know victims comp yes they have to get something from the treatment provider to just ensure that oh you're treating them on issues related to this victimization okay great um, so you know we've had luck fighting those issues in court so um, if you do have any of those issues that's another thing feel free to give us a call um, and we can help um, give you some support and guidance in those sort of issues but I know I've dealt with this out in Adams and Weld, and we've had, you know, good success on those issues, so. 
Yeah, absolutely. So the second question before we move along is giving an could we give an example of what information might be private to the victim versus the law? So a good example um, that I was thinking of while Kelly was talking about the other, the answer to the other question. Um, so if an individual has had, you, I, I mean the example I'm going to get is social media. So for a lot of folks, like if you have your Facebook on the most private settings, we see that, we can think of that as like, well, this is my private Facebook. Um, but that's just really not the case. So it's the concept of like, you know, if you've had conversations with somebody or if you've had um, a text message conversation that feels private because it's between you and another person, um, under the law, oftentimes those conversations aren't confidential. Um, they're certainly not privileged unless that person is an advocate who's on the clock or an attorney who's acting as that person's attorney. Um, so I think, you know, about family and right where you know if someone texts me something I'm going to keep that private for them but it's not private under the law if someone asks me to turn over my cell phone or turn over um, records of having talked to somebody and I wasn't working as an advocate at that time then it's not considered private right right perfect okay okay so Privilege. Uh, this is this is the big shield that you get to throw up to prevent um, information from being disclosed, um, and it really comes down to do does the information was the information communicated within some of these? Oh, you went backwards. Sorry. <laughs> um, was the information communicated within the confines of some of these specific relationships that are set forth in statute? Um, the ones that really kind of apply to victimization or um, survivors that are going through the criminal justice system are generally potentially an attorney-client relationship, a doctor-patient relationship, a therapist or mental health professional relation, patient relationship, uh, a victim-advocate relationship, and again, that is a community-based victim-advocate and there are also very specific requirements for that advocate, um, victim advocate, patient relationship to, not patient, I'm sorry, victim advocate privilege to kick in a certain number of training hours, a certain type of organization that they are working for. So that is not just, you know, any, any organization that considers themselves like, oh, we do victim advocacy work in housing, um, you know, but it's not specifically what is required under the statute. Um, your clergy penitent uh, relationship and uh, some spousal relationships. So um, within the confines of some of these relationships, the communications are actually pr protected by statute as privileged communications. What is fantastic in Colorado is that this is absolute privilege in Colorado, which means the information cannot be released without a waiver. Colorado has some of the strongest privilege laws in the country. I didn't realize how strong Colorado's privilege laws were until I left and started doing some work for a bunch of different states summarizing their law and realized, oh my goodness, like I couldn't believe how strong Colorado's privilege law was. So this is this is really something to to look at and to protect and honor. Um, basically, as a matter of public policy, our legislature has determined that we need to encourage candor in certain relationships, and these are some of those relationships. Um, in each of those relationships, the client, the patient, the victim, those people who are, are sharing their personal private information, they are the owner of the privilege. So they are the ones that get to say, yes, I'm going to waive my privilege, or no, I'm not, and you, as my attorney, or you, as my victim advocate, cannot disclose the confidential communications that we have had. Um, the, the effect of that is essentially to bar the lawyer, or the doctor, or the therapist, or the advocate from revealing what was said to that person in confidence. Um, and that is really important to remember, because a lot of the times when the information is attempted to be being accessed by the defense, they won't go to the victim, they won't go to the patient, they won't go to the person who actually owns the privilege, they'll go on the other side and they'll just try to access the records from the other, the other party to that relationship. 
And so it's really important that um, if you have a, a survivor or a victim who is you know, revealing confidences, who is working with anybody who has some of these privileged relationships, to ensure that the other side of that relationship knows there is a criminal case going on, there is an investigation, Our, the victim here is asserting their privilege, they are affirmatively wanting to protect their privilege so that the other side is on notice in case something, in case they get a subpoena, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but these are, I think, the most kind of um, frequent uh, relationships that come up in the criminal justice process when we're talking about actual privileged communication. Ashley, do you have anything else on that? No, that's perfect. Okay. All right. So moving on to confidentiality, which is different, um, although sometimes there are overlapping pieces, right? Mm -hmm. So. These are less regulated relationships. As Kelly mentioned before, it's really about what contractual or duty-based obligation do you have this person? Is it something that you've created in your policy? Do you have obligations that come from VAWA funding, for example? Um, is this an ethical standard that you have through your organization or through your profession? Um, and so a lot of times I bring up to folks, particularly as it relates to survivors and their um, needs that are related to the victimization but not directly met through victim services, things like housing, or um, if an individual is going in and applying for food stamps, things like that, that may be a secondary need after having been victimized, but those individuals don't have privilege in the same way that a sex assault or DV advocate might have. Um, additionally, as I mentioned before when I was giving the example for what a victim might think is private versus what a um, what the law says is private, you know, family and friends, we often speak to those of us, um, speak to folks in our communities about what's happened to us. Um, if you're sharing information on, in a support group on Facebook, you know, there may be sort of this overarching belief that, you know, I can hold these things in confidence. We have this um, mutually agreed upon sense of confidentiality, but that there's no legal standard for that and no way to necessarily block the defense for requesting and then getting that information. Um, additionally, when we talk about on the previous page, individuals who do have privilege, there are sort of, um, what's the right way to say this, there are, are, are issues that come up when someone is mandated reporter. So if someone is um, a social worker and they're working as a DV or sex assault victim advocate and, and it comes out that there's child abuse or neglect, there's um, the potential for suicidality or homicidality, there may be that breach of information. It doesn't necessarily waive privilege um, to, so suddenly, oh, we had this one area where we had to provide mandated reporting on this person, suddenly all of their therapeutic records are available, um, if this were in a therapist-client relationship. But at the same time, you do break privilege to go make those reports. Um, so wanting to keep that in mind, that that does affect the privacy, particularly if it's a case where you're reporting on an issue related somehow to the crime itself. Um, and just when, when an individual is entitled to confidentiality but not privilege, those records are significantly more easily accessed. So just wanting to, to keep that in mind and, and knowing the standards for your own organization. So as we mentioned before at the very beginning with one of the first practical tips, taking a look at this one, you know, victims come into contact with many, many different individuals while meeting the needs to all, all their needs related to the victimization that they've, they've experienced. And again, just wanting to keep track of what is the privilege level, what is the confidentiality level, um, and recognizing that even people who advocate on their behalf may not be entitled to the same privilege that an advocate would have if they were working through a DV or sex assault agency, for example. Um, I know we've gotten a couple questions, so I want to make sure we get to those. Um, I think one of the other pieces in areas where RMBLC can be helpful, because this is sort of a messy area, um, it's confusing, it doesn't necessarily um, get pieced apart very well before folks jump from organization to organization getting their needs met potentially. So feel free to call ARM VLC if there's a question about privacy, about privilege, confidentiality, and as a service provider, even as a victim, you want to know how to best navigate that. Um, feel free to call our organization and we can hopefully work through that and do some research and, and, and really look at the law and how it might pertain to the issue at hand. So um, just to move on to some of these questions. Uh, 
Um, the first one, and I, I'm putting you on the spot again, Kelly, uh, what specific statutes at both a state and federal level are involved? And I think this came in when we were talking about privilege. Sure. Well, the, the Colorado statute is Colorado Revised Statute um, 1390-106. I know that one off the top of my head. Um, I don't have any of the federal statutes um, at hand, but I can, um, I can definitely see what um, those are and, and get those out. I think some of these questions, um, there may be stuff that we can kind of answer during the webinar, and there may be some that you know, we can follow up with you afterwards um, to get some more specific information. But the Colorado statute that specifically addresses privilege um, is 1390-106. And so that's definitely a good one to have um, whenever some of these issues come up. So then the second question, again, about privilege is um, if we could speak to the privilege of DHS, the Department of Human Services staff, when there is a criminal case going on. I don't know if you have the answer to that as well, Kelly. You know, I don't have that. I don't believe, I mean, unless there are specific um, internal policies within DHS, um, DHS doesn't have privilege um, under Colorado law under the, the privilege statute specifically. So um, I need to look at that, um, but I can definitely look at that and get back with you um, after the webinar for sure. And I, oops, we're going to move on to the slide here in a moment, but I think just to add to that, you know, what, wherever you might be at, looking at those internal policies is going to give you the good groundwork and framework for how your organization deals with these issues initially. Um, and it will be valuable, again, going back to one of those practical tips from the beginning, getting a sense of not only who are you referring to, but then what are your own policies? How can you talk to and provide truly informed consent to your victims about their privilege and what they might be sharing um, to you in, in, in what they think is confidence um, when really perhaps there are different um, rules and regulations through your organization that require you to disclose or not disclose? Great. Yeah. Um, so privilege, kind of when you're trying to think about privilege versus confidentiality, and I think Ashley mentioned this earlier, um, some information can certainly be both confidential and privileged. Um, and when that happens, it's just important to remember that the rights of privilege control. So that information can only be released, be released with the victim's permission. So for example, um, the example we have here is if you have a victim advocate Center um, that may provide confidential services. They um, and they may be required to provide confidential services by their funders. They get VAWA money um, for whatever it is that they the services that they're providing. Within that organization, they also offer some services that fall into one of those specific relationships, like mental health counseling, um, that contain privileged information and privileged communication. So. While somebody might be able to get access to um, some of the other communications that are going on helping with the services that are outside of the mental health counseling, when it comes to the mental health counseling and that information, because that specifically comes under the privilege statute, the, the laws of privilege control and that that information can absolutely not be released without a waiver. That, I hope that makes sense, so, yeah. Great. Um, so let's get another poll going. I'm going to open the poll. Um, so we're talking a little bit about releases of information. Let me go ahead and launch the poll. So what we're asking is, um, oh gosh, why did this, it's like skipping ahead. Do, do, do. We're on this poll question, everyone, um, the one about have you ever created your own release of information or waiver form? Um, so we want to just get a sense of, you know, have you created one? Yes, or ROI only? Yes, waiver only? C, both? D, neither? Um, and E, what in the world is an ROI or a waiver? Um, so, fantastic. So we have about 62% coming in. I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds. I'm going to do my best not to continue flipping through all these slides and crossing over stuff. Um, and then we will move right along and talk a little bit about ROIs and waivers. And just while we're waiting for this poll to close, I saw we had another question that came in um, asking about the privilege statute that I said, and I completely misspoke. You're right. It's not um, 106. It's 107. 
So 1391.07 is the privilege statute, and I am so sorry about that. Great. Wonderful. So we're at 81%. I'm going to go ahead and close this and share those results with you all. Fantastic. So that you can see. So it looks like um, about 18% were saying that they had created an ROI. 24% had said that they had created both. 47% no, and 12% of you are like, I don't know what an ROI is, and I'm ready to learn. So let's have a share. Um, before we do that, of those of you who answered, oh, I have to close this, hold on. <laughs> um, so those of you who answered yes, A, B, or C um, to the questions before, so yes, an ROI, yes, a waiver, or yes to both, um, we want to kind of follow up with that question and just ask, did you contact or consult with an attorney that had expertise in this area before you created those and or began using them. So let me open that poll for you. And we'll just give that just a couple of seconds for folks to answer that real quick. Um, you know, this is an important question for us just because it gives us a sense of, you know, how can we address the next couple parts, talking a little bit about releases of information and waivers um, based on who has had consultation with outside attorneys prior to creating these. Um, so I'm just going to give it about five more seconds. We only have about 30% um, people in, but of course not everyone answered that way. So we're just going to go ahead and close. And we're split pretty evenly on all the answers. So let me go ahead and share that. So about a third of you answered yes, a third no, and a third asked why does this matter? So let's get into that and why it does. So in terms of releases of information, and I know that Kelly will talk a little bit more about this as well, um, social work standards include creating releases that uh, provide informed consent, which is more than just this is what you're filling this out for, but also how will it affect you? How could it potentially impact um, future services? And in cases where folks are victims of crime, we want to make sure that that informed consent also takes into consideration how it might impact their case. Um, social work standards also say that releases must be time limited and issue specific. So we want to make sure that that time limited component also addresses not only, great, this release is, is okay and we can use it for 30 days or a week or whatever, but also speaks to the time limited um, component of what am I releasing? Am I releasing all mental health records from this period of time to this, or am I releasing just one month of, of therapeutic records? Um, so it's time specific both in how long the release is going to be good for and how long of a time period are we talking about releasing. Um, issue specific, so we want to make sure another example would be are we really releasing you know, medical records, for example, related to the crime specifically or are we releasing all medical records? That's a huge difference for folks. Um, and we want to make sure that when we're creating releases of information with the assistance of, of attorneys who have an expertise in victims' privacy, that we're talking about making them as specific as possible. Um, we also want them to include a clear way to rescind that release, to revoke the, the, the party who's received the release of information, so if it was me, to tell me, I don't want to release this anymore, um, you know, just you, regardless of whether that time period has lapsed for which the release was fine, that there's an easy way for a person to know how to do that. Do you need to call me? Do you need to write to me via email? Can you fax me information saying, I no longer want you to release any of my information? And I think it's really, from a legal standpoint, the, the big thing that I just want to drive home is make sure that all of this stuff, you just document, document, document. You want to make sure that you have clear documentation in your records of when release of information was executed, when it was rescinded, all of the stuff that Ashley just talked about. Um, one of the, and this is for your own protection. Um, one of the worst you know, things you can do is uh, have the conversation, make sure that you're going through all this information, and then fail to have some way to establish and, and document that you had these conversations and that the in consent was informed and, and all of that. So just make sure that you are documenting um, all of this throughout. And I think another important piece just about releases of information is if you do have one that your organization has created or that you created, that you're getting those reviewed on a schedule. Um, you know, if, if we wait 5, 10, gosh, 15 or 20 years before reviewing releases of information because this is the way we've always done it, you know, precedent and policy and law change related to victims' privacy, and it really takes um, 
time to make sure that we're reviewing those regularly and, and not somehow creating these loopholes or issues for our survivors when we're working with them because we haven't updated or, or looked into the law as it pertains to privacy currently. So in terms of the practical tip just at the bottom, um, it's not just about what information you're sending out um, or what information you're receiving, but how you get it and send it. Um, so recognizing that different forms of communication are more and less secure um, and that we want to choose the level that best protects our clients. So that level and sort of hierarchy is that mail is safest, so certainly certified mail where you're able to track where it is, where it's been. Um, in case it were to get lost, for example, and then then followed by fax, then followed by email. And if you are emailing something, you know, try and, and I'm not the most tech savvy person, I'm sure as the CCASA staff knows now that we tried to set up uh, this webinar and get the polls going and I was very intimidated by that, but we really have to try and look what are the best and most secure ways that we can send emails. Um, can we password protect them? Is it enough just to encrypt? Um, and so I think that it's important important for us to recognize that, you know, we're not always the experts on those things and reach out to folks that might be, which we'll talk a little bit about what that resource looks like in the community, both on a, um, primarily on a federal level. So one of the specific types of releases of information is a waiver, and that's typically the language that we use when we're talking about privilege. Um, waivers can be one of, of two forms. They can be express or implied. An express waiver is when a, a survivor fills out a waiver form. There is some sort of written um, waiver form that they are authorizing the release of privileged communications. Um, an implied or they are they are ex or verbally um, giving express permission. Yes, to my mental health therapist, you can talk to. Uh, the investigator about what we discussed or so it's it's an actual verbal or written usually written um, clear expression of waiver of the privilege um, an implied waiver of privilege is um, where your actions or um, deeds basically give rise to the inference that you were you were waiving your privilege so what that means is if you go and discuss information that was privileged and protected by privilege because it was protected between you and one of those other um, parties in a, in a privileged relationship, your doctor, your attorney, your um, victim advocate from a community-based organization, that's the statute. Um, you go and relay the content of those communications to somebody else that does not have privilege, so you go tell your sister or your mother or your husband, or, well, not necessarily your husband, but um, a friend, yeah, well, I went to therapy and, I, you know, we discussed this and I told her this and she said that. Those sort of exposing the, the, the sanctity of that confidential relationship to an outside party is an implied waiver of privilege. Um, waivers, typically express waivers, can be either general or they can be limited. So a general waiver basically waives everything. It's an open um, waiver of the, the protections afforded in this relationship. A limited waiver is a way to limit the, what you are allowing to be disclosed to a specific subset of that information. It doesn't open the door to everything. Um, and we're going to talk about limited, limited waivers of privilege next. Um, but it's also important to always kind of be thinking about who actually has the right to waive the privilege because we're not always talking about situations where you're dealing with adults. Obviously, adults have the, the right to waive to make those decisions on their own, but when you're dealing with minors, um, depending on the age of the minor um, and if it's a situation where they are old enough to access services under the law on their own, or if they're not, you're, you've got a seven-year-old who's in, in therapy, um, then it's typically the parent, the adult, who has uh, decision-making authority over that minor that is the person that gets to decide whether or not that privilege um, can get waived. So just another little kind of factor you always want to be thinking about when you do have minors, who, who is the, the privilege holder for, for that minor. Um, it's also kind of important to 
remind victims that in order to protect their privileges, um, they want to be mindful of the presence of third parties. Now, um, some situations, especially as we go into the criminal justice system, there are going to be things and situations where you may have the presence of a third party, um, but that doesn't necessarily waive the privilege, whereas communicating what the confidential communications are between you and the privileged um, other party of that of that relationship that would waive it. So, for example, um, you know, having having a victim your victim advocate accompany you through a sane exam, the, the mere presence of the victim advocate in the room when you are having the um, sane exam doesn't waive any of the privilege. But sharing, um, if they're sharing that information outside of what um, the victim says, then there is a potential for um, waiver there. Um, Ashley, did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I think one of the, and this really relates to the practical tip as well. So one of the challenges is that we see oftentimes that victims or we see from subpoenas and, and the defense stating that like, oh, we, we, because you had your advocate there, it means I know you're getting services, right. and thus you need to turn them all over to me, um, which is just not true. Um, you know, this is also sort of an overarching thing that we've talked a little bit about but haven't really given a name to throughout this webinar is that we may see, you know, here in this webinar bubble of understanding around victims' privacy, we know that these types of things, victims have privacy and that they're entitled to this, but that doesn't mean that defense attorneys aren't going to ask for information to which we don't believe that they're entitled. Um, so this is an area, this is one of those examples, right? Defense attorneys may see that and be like, I kind of know that victims are entitled to this, but I'm just going to try. And given that judges are the ones who make the final decision about what does and doesn't happen related to the disclosure and release of this information, um, they may just try and see what happens. And I know, you know, Kelly mentioned that at the very beginning, is that things differ from courtroom to courtroom and certain jurisdictions are more and less strict or um, safe about kind of what, what happens moving forward. So with that practical tip, um, you know, if, if you're going with a victim to a meeting with law enforcement or with district attorney's office, you just want to make sure that you have a signal with your victim about how can we step out and have this conversation or how can we take a break. You know, a lot of times I'm like, oh, I, you know, hey, I need water. Like, I'm constantly thirsty. Um, and so you just find a way to develop that rapport or relationship and communicate tool so that you don't, as an advocate, begin speaking in a um, meeting or in some sort of interview where your communications could then pull you in as someone who has, you know, implied their waiver of um, the privilege that they had for the original conversations you had with the survivor. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, limited waivers. This is this is super super important. And if you take away nothing else, I, I want you to take away that you absolutely victims and advocates helping victims absolutely have the right to limit any sort of waiver that is put in front of them for any of their privileged information. So it's whether you're given a general form or um, that has blanks to fill in, or you need to hand write on the form that you're given to modify some of what they're requesting, limited waivers are the way to go. There's absolutely nothing that should just be given a general waiver when it comes to somebody's privilege. And, and the way that you can do that is there's a number of things that you can modify. Um, you can modify who is actually getting the information. And be specific. Don't just say, um, you know, law enforcement or investigators. Say Boulder County law enforcement. Don't just say DAs or attorneys. Say Arapahoe County District Attorney Office. Um, you can limit what is being waived be, and be very specific with exactly what information is allowed to be disclosed and what is not allowed. For example, you might say only medical information related directly to the sexual assault and not any of my prior medical history. So that it is very clear for the person who is going to be turning over the information on what it is limited to. Um, you can modify where, make sure that you identify both um, what a service provider is allowed to disclose the information and who isn't. So every service provider should have their own waiver. Um, this might feel like a hassle to do a form for each individual provider. So for your mental health provider, the 
um, you know, your primary care physician, whatever the providers are, other than just one general pr waiver to law enforcement to go get everything. Um, but you will very much be grateful in the long run because that will also help if you need to go back and you want to revoke a waiver, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute from one provider or, or the next, but be very specific for who this waiver is for. Um, when? Dates are important. So um, include the dates of the treatment records that you are releasing and an expiration date for the waiver itself. Make the expiration date, I, I always advise, no further out than 60 days from when you sign it. Um, it may mean that you have to execute multiple waivers as a case moves throughout the process, but um, it is just another way to safeguard a victim's information. Um, why? Uh, again, you want to be specific about the purpose of the waiver. So, for, for example, writing on the actual form something like, this release is for Boulder County Victim Compensation to verify my treatment status, or for Boulder County District Attorney's Office to access this information for trial preparation. Um, if you are uncertain about the purpose, ask the person who is requesting you to release the information why exactly they want it. Um, because that way, the other thing you need to remember is any waivers that you sign for law enforcement, for the prosecution, in a criminal proceeding, it becomes part of the discovery it is one of those documents that gets turned over to the defense as part of here's all of the, the investigation that we've accumulated. What frequently happens is they then take that waiver and if it is not very specific and spelled out, they go around and try to use it to get other information that they are not entitled to that the waiver was not intended to cover. So that's why it's really important to be specific with this stuff. Um, and how? You get to state your intention. So with this kind of you you can say what you um, are and what you're not doing so for example I write on my waivers um, this waiver is not intended to waive my confidentiality in all of my past medical records the documents listed above may not be released until any prior medical history contained therein is redacted so basically look I'm gonna I've already spelled out you can take you know you can release this and this and this but you need to go into that history and take out these things that are that are unnecessary. So victims get to decide what gets waived and what doesn't, and so limited waivers are super important. So. And if there are questions about how to do that, um, call us. I mean, we we see these so much more frequently than other folks, but those limited waivers can be tricky because we want to make sure that we catch all the potential for challenge or um, implied waivers. So we want to provide support in that arena as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the question then is, can you unring the bell, um, you know, once information is kind of out there? Well, you can always revoke an express waiver of privilege or an express release of information. Um, you can't actually unring the bell, but you can attempt to prevent further disclosure. Um, and that's by you doing a, a revocation, by ref informing all professionals of the revocation. Call your therapist when you've revoked the waiver that you previously did and say, hey, I've revoked that waiver. I am asserting my privilege. I don't want anything else given out. Um, and, and you do that both, you assert, assert that privilege both to your the professionals involved as well as in court um, if that is necessary. Um, you can always argue to that the, the waiver that you did execute doesn't open the door to anything. So, hey, my limited waiver was very specific. It does not open the door. The fact that I waived this does not mean that you. it opens the door to my prior history or anything that happened after the assault. Um, and this is one of those situations in Colorado, at least, where there are specific rights under the VRA that allow victims to have a right to be heard um, at any hearing involving the subpoena for privileged records. So this is one of those cases where Here's a specific right you have under the VRA to um, to address these things. And so I know we have limited time, so I'm going to, you probably have noticed we're talking faster, so I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly just to make sure that we have time to capture just a better conversation about subpoenas coming up. Um, of course, don't go it alone. There's a confidentiality institute. Um, utilize that as a resource, as well as experienced attorneys to review um, 
limited waivers, and express waivers, ROIs, and that can be our office. And if we need help, we usually reach out to the confidentiality institute whom we have a great partnership with. You know, ask victims first what they'd like, and then act second. And that goes the same for, you know, ask your organization, what are the next steps that I need to do? Act second. This really comes into play when we're talking about subpoenas as well. Ask first, what do you want released? Um, do you, you know, ask the person who holds that privilege. Know who's present in their level of confidentiality and privilege related to your client. This is what we were talking about before. If you're going to an interview or a meeting with um, the DA or law enforcement, just know the confidentiality levels of the people you're in the room with. And if you are in a room with someone who has um, less confidentiality or no confidentiality, ask to take breaks. And if you're in a room with someone who has privilege and all you have is confidentiality, be okay if that person asks you to step out. Um, it's protecting your client. And then certainly know your limits and know who to reach out to if you have more questions. We're going to skip the poll questions and just dive right into talking about subpoenas. Okay, so there's two different kinds of subpoenas that some of you may have had experience with. There's a subpoena to testify and there's a, a subpoena to produce records or documents. It's called a subpoena duces tecum or an SDT. Um, and so you may have seen one or both of these. In Colorado, subpoenas are issued by attorneys, not the courts. So it's not something that um, a party has already gone to a court and made arguments why they should be allowed to ask you for these documents. And then the court said, yep, I agree. I'm going to issue an order and you go ahead and you go get those documents from that therapist. That's not how this works. Um, the attorneys have the authority to just issue the subpoena themselves. Um, then whether or not how that subpoena, if it's quashed, meaning um, dismissed or whether the those records do have to be produced or how they are produced or um, you know what gets produced that's all stuff that gets argued later if there's a challenge to the subpoena so it's really important to um, not just if you get a subpoena just oh yeah here you go here's all all the records that I have because um, it can absolutely implicate privilege and and other protections and privacy protections that victims may have um, another note just to be aware of, there's, um, you aren't considered served with a subpoena until there is either personal service or a waiver of service. So you may get a, a subpoena in the mail, um, and, and oftentimes it includes a waiver of service, so it's a, a way of asking you to, hey, send this postcard back or sign this um, document saying you received the subpoena and send it back. You do that, you're saying, yep, I have received the subpoena, I will comply with the subpoena. Um, and then you need to show up in court when it tells you to show up. Um, if you don't decide that you're going to send back the waiver, then they have to personally serve you, which means they have to show up and hand you, um, somebody's going to show up and hand you that, that subpoena. So um, before people kind of, if you get a subpoena before you start freaking out, you, this is another issue you can call us on, but those are generally the two types of, of subpoenas that you might see. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, what's really important here is that you need to find out, and I recommend doing this now, um, find out what your organization's policy is on how to handle or respond to subpoenas. Um, you know, run it up your chain, find out is there a policy in place, have you guys ever had to deal with this before. You don't want to be scrambling at the last minute or your executive director is, you know, away or, or something when something like this happens and you don't know how to appropriately respond. Um, find out if your organization has legal counsel on staff, do you have counsel that is on call if something like this comes up. If not, you know, you need to potentially have a discussion about identifying somebody that you can contact in those situations. Um, the biggest thing is always, always, always notify the victim when you receive a subpoena for documents that contain privileged or, or confidential information. The um, privilege holder is supposed to be notified whenever a subpoena for their documents or records is served. However, in practice, this rarely happens. I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen a subpoena um, that the defense attorney just sent to the therapist or sent to the doctor or sent to whoever had the privileged documents and also sent me a copy as the victim's attorney or as the prosecutor or notified the victim. So they, they're supposed to, but they just don't do that. 
Um, and the other thing is, I, I think it's a really good idea to get clear on your own professional and ethical duties and how far you're willing to go to protect a victim or a client's um, privilege before any of this comes up. Um, because the last thing you want to do is, is be scrambling at the last minute. Ashley? Yeah. So again, I mean, I think we're really reiterating sort of this continued piece of, you know, victims don't have control over what information is being sought or introduced. And there are a lot of reasons why a party may want access. Um, I'll let you speak to that a little bit. Sure. So, um, you know, a party may want information because the prosecution or law enforcement needs it to help build or, you know, solidify their case to make a decision of whether or not they can go forward. The defense is certainly looking for information that they can use to um, help uh, exonerate their client at trial. Um, what it comes down to, though, because there's not a lot of things that the victim is going to get to have control over, you know, what people are trying to find or what they're trying to introduce in court, there are some legal standards um, before something can actually be admitted at trial. Um, you know, it has to be relevant evidence. Unfortunately, that simply just means evidence having any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence, which really anything can be. There's an argument that can be made that just about anything is relevant. Um, and so, you know, that can bring up some anxiety for victims a lot of the times. Um, there's rules about, like, what is permissible evidence, what is impermissible, how that evidence can be used. Um, but it's also important to remind victims that there's a difference between um, getting access to that information and actually being able to use it at trial. So sometimes there may be evidence or information that the defense, you know, gets is able to obtain the investigation process, but isn't necessarily going to be able to be used at trial. Um, so it just kind of there's there's different standards um, throughout the, the process. Um, and it's important to prepare victims for all possibilities. They have a right to say no to certain things, but they also need to be aware um, and informed of what the consequences are going to be for, for that decision. Um, and just, again, this is that knowledge is key. Having those conversations, making sure that victims understand, um, you know, what their options are. And I think for social workers in general or folks who aren't attorneys, sometimes can feel like this walks the line with the unauthorized practice of law, talking through all of the possible potential outcomes. What we really want to ensure is that folks understand what could happen, what you've seen as a service provider happen before, um, and then getting people connected back to folks who can go into more detail about how could this really impact your case specifically. Um, those generalities of, you know, this could have a positive or negative effect on how the DA or prosecution moves forward with your case because you aren't comfortable releasing whatever. That is a conversation we can start to have as social workers, but we want to make sure that attorneys are talking about the, the specifics of how it directly affects their case. So I know that we have just a couple more minutes, so I'm going to um, go through this somewhat quickly. And, and certainly if folks have more questions about these types of issues, please contact us directly. But we want to make sure that our, our we recognize, and this is where this question and practical tip came up before, you know, our private lives are really, really public now. You know, we have social media that connects us to everything that we do. And for example, when we have phone dumps um, for victims of crime, we're dumping everything on there, which includes the majority of someone's life. Um, and so we want to recognize that that's such a big piece of what it means to have your privacy come into court. Um, pieces and things that you wouldn't have thought would be important. So if someone's just dumping a phone to get particular text messages, um, you're also dumping the entirety of the phone that then could potentially go into discovery. So when we were talking about limited waivers um, and limited releases, this is an area where we've seen that be very powerful for folks, as well as, you know, in cases with sexual assault, domestic violence, and stalking cases in particular, wanting to make sure that the information related to location setting or um, contact lists, that those are either under seal if they are dumping the entire phone, or that they are somehow um, not able to get those because it does really create this issue of, you know, the defense could contact somebody, every single person on someone's contact list, or um, an individual who's being stalked could then 
their defendant could potentially have access to all of the location information that one can get off of a, a phone. Um, so we just want to make sure of that piece. And, and certainly the practical tip here is really about having compassion. When folks say it's hard for them to get off social media, it's not necessarily um, that I just can't turn the Facebook phone, like app off my phone. It's also the way that people who've been in trauma who feel isolated as a result of that stay in touch with people, join support groups on, on Facebook and on, on the internet, you know, wanting to use that as a, a means to let people know that they're safe. So we just want to make sure that we're having compassion for folks when they're going through these issues, even though it might seem simple to those of us who aren't going through that currently. Um, these, I think, are pretty uh, great practical tips in terms of privacy and then sort of blending over into safety. Um, I'm not going to go through these individually because we don't have the time for that today, but if you um, read through them and have more questions, again, reach out. Um, there are some sort of local and state level safety options that folks can either opt into if they're interested or at least consider. So the Address Confidentiality Program, which is a statewide program, um, witness protection and victims comp programs are jurisdictionally controlled. While there is always a victims comp program for a jurisdiction, witness protection may not be available for all jurisdictions. So we want to recognize that that um, while it is a nice feature of particularly larger jurisdictions, it's not present in every jurisdiction. And then um, also community and system-based safety planning. We want to recognize that the experts in the field really lie within those organizations that see this work all the time. While RMVLC does safety planning with folks, we're often not working with people who are in immediate crisis. We're working with them while they're already engaged with the criminal justice system. And so oftentimes we'll get people connected if they do move back into that higher crisis position or time um, where they're trying to flee or escape. Um, we get kept back connected with people who are experts in the field who do this work regularly so that they're, they know folks who have a good understanding of the changing landscape of safety within the community. Um, ACP and witness protection are really, really hard for victims to stay in long term for a lot of people. And so wanting to get to know those programs so that we can utilize portions or pieces of them to help increase safety for victims if they're not willing or able to stay in those programs long term. Um, the next two slides, uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time going over, but these are specific laws and specific rights that victims have under Colorado's VRA that address various safety issues, um, whether it's safe, secure waiting area, um, separate from the defense in the courthouse, the ability to be informed of protection orders, steps to take in case there's any sort of intimidation or harassment. Um, you can go to the next one real quick, Ashley. Um, victims, you know, can't be compelled to provide their current address, phone number, or place of employment, or any other locating information in an open court proceeding. Um, they have the right to have their social security number redacted from some released reports, and uh, upon request, they can also request that corrections officials keep their personal contact information um, confidential. The one other kind of thing I just wanted to piggyback on really safety tips with the social media thing is, when it comes to the cell phones, one thing I just want to make hammer home um, when they, when law enforcement uses Celebrite and downloads all of the information from the phone, like it's everything. And remember, we talked about discovery and, and stuff. Frequently, just everything gets turned over. There's usually nothing. Um, most of the times, when they need, they're trying to, you know, uh, document certain text messages that might be important to a case. There's nothing that that um, prevents them from just taking screenshots of those text messages, and that's a way to um, protect the victim's privacy and not release, you know, a full contact list and all the other stuff that Ashley had talked about. So. And that really relates really well to the practical tip. It's okay to advocate for that with DA's offices, with law enforcement, as a community-based advocate. Um, it can be intimidating, as I mentioned before, when I came into this position, I did not have a lot of experience working directly, particularly with attorneys. Um, so it really takes, again, that practice. It's not just for the survivors. It's for us as service providers to practice how you're going to advocate for your victims and what you're going to do when they potentially push back initially because they want what's best for their their case. And so this can be an area sometimes where there's a little bit of butting head, but let's advocate and reach out to community resources for extra support if needed on either side. Um, so these practical safety tips are pretty um, self-explanatory. Obviously know your resources and your limits, respect the victim's intuition, and understand trauma with its interplay to safety and its interplay with safety. So if a person, um, one of the big things we try to ensure and, and, and sort of harp on maybe perhaps with victims is make sure you have a list of all the documents you might need or the identification you might need if you if you need to leave quickly. Um, you know, a lot of times people will leave very quickly in the middle of a criminal case where the defendant then finds out where they're living and they lose their identification or things that they might need for court. Um, 
you know, prescriptions, glasses, those types of things. And again, of course, recognizing the interplay between safety and privacy. If you need to um, do safety planning with someone who's a community-based advocate versus a systems advocate because you're afraid of disclosing currently where you live or disclosing information that you're afraid through that safety planning will get turned over to the defense and put you at risk, think about why, why those things are happening and if you can get connected with someone um, who has more confidentiality or perhaps has privilege to help support that person if they're concerned about disclosing to you and then your obligations to disclose to the defense. Um, and of course, get different perspectives on safety from multidisciplinary like sources. Our office is really great. We have attorneys and uh, social workers on staff, and so we can get a good picture of, you know, how do we handle the safety issues that arise for our clients um, in a way that protects their privacy, protects their safety, and, and really helps them move towards the goal they want for their case, which is often conviction. Um, we're skipping this poll, and then we're to the questions. So I know that there was one question that came in, um, and I hope that you are still here to get this answer, um, Kimberly. And it, no, we don't have any resources in our office that helps um, with service in another county in Colorado. So for example, if, if a victim, particularly like a protection order case, is looking to serve someone who's in a different county, we don't have service, um, any support or resources to help with that service. Yeah, no problem. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for sticking with us and um, coming to this training and webinar. As we mentioned, we'll send out these PowerPoints here shortly. Make sure that you get access to them. And as always, um, moving on to the last page, you can contact us at these places. Um, and just let us know if you have questions. We're happy to talk through things. Um, and certainly, if you're referring people over to us, soft handoffs are a great way to make sure that we're the right resource um, so people aren't really traumatized by having to retell their story over and over again. Um, and we can help you on the back end with things too because you all are such competent and excellent uh, service providers and we want to be able to support the work that you're already doing with victims. Yeah, thank you so much for attending everybody. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, uh, well thank you all. Um, I would like to thank Ashley and Kelly for being with us today. It was a wonderful and very informative presentation. I would like to uh, thank you all for staying with us as well and to invite you for the next uh, two webinars that we're going to have. One of them is going to be the February 27th and is from Colorado Youth Matters and is dating shouldn't be hazardous to teens promoting healthy relationships. So it's, it's an, um, an uh, a webinar that will bring a lot of information since February is Teen Dating Awareness Month. The next uh, uh, webinar that we will have will be March 1st and is uh, with Rocky Mountain Victor Law Center and is on authorized practices of law. So we would love to invite you all to be with us in the next for the next two webinars. And again, please, 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 please fill out the survey and let us know how we're doing and other ideas that you may have for trainings. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.